Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jordi Galí. I'm the current president of the uh, Catalan Economic Society. And I just want to say a couple of things. First, to welcome you all uh, to the third Congress of the Society. We had the Congress in 2017, one in 2019. Then we had to cancel the following con uh, Congress because of the pandemic, and we're, we're back at full strength. As you can see, we're very happy. We got more, more submissions uh, uh, than ever. And uh, well, I hope that uh, you are all enjoying the Congress and that you'll, you'll choose to, to, to come back next, next time in, in a couple of years. This is a biannual, a biannual Congress, okay? Well, the second um, thing I want to tell you is, well, the reason why we're here is, is to introduce our, our keynote speaker today, uh, Professor Ernst Fur. Um, he needs no introduction, but and I'll, I will be very brief because we really want to, to listen to him. Um, Ernst uh, uh, very kindly agreed to, to come to give this uh, plenary, plenary lecture. Um, he's uh, the chair for microeconomics and experimental economics at the University of Zurich and the director of the UBS Center for Economics in Society. Uh, and he's, uh, no, he's received uh, numerous awards, including several honorary uh, doctorates. He has been president of the European Economic Association. He's a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences in the US. But most importantly, as you all know, uh, he's been extremely, inf uh, he's made in very influential contributions to, to several literatures. Uh, literatures that many of which he has pioneered. Uh, he is one of the leading um, and the starting uh, um, uh, economists who, who, who got uh, certain lines of research going. So he's, um, in particular, he's done uh, um, in very interesting and influential work on the theor and theor both theoretical and, and experimental on, on human behavior in, in social contexts looking at uh, deviations from the assumptions of, uh, of full uh, rationality and also in particular of and the assumption of uh, self-interest, uh, which we, most of us, typically embed uh, in our models. And, um, and I have to say, he, well, he has also made important contributions more, more recently to, to neuroeconomics, you know, to the bi biological foundation, looking for the biological foundations of, of those deviations from, from um, self-interest uh, behavior, and, and more generally, uh, the biological foundations for decision, uh, economic decision-making. And he even has, I mean, his, his CV is, um, is uh, huge. I, if you look at, at his CV, I would recommend that uh, you look at it on the screen, don't print it because you'll run out of paper. Uh, there are 30, 32 pages. And uh, uh, he's made, uh, you know, he, the number of publications is, 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 is um, amazing. And he's even made some contributions to, to macroeconomics. I remember I, and he, in, and he has a paper with, um, with Lawrence Goethe that I remember discussing a long time ago, and that was one of the first papers in that provided evidence of the, of the relevance of downward nominal wage rigidities using data from different cantons in Switzerland that had, uh, at that time, very low inflation. Switzerland was uh, uh, the country that had the lowest inflation probably in the, among advanced economies, and, and they were able to to, to, to uncover the, the, uh, this uh, strong evidence of downward nominal wage rigidities and to correlate it with uh, unemployment rates and so on. So we're very honored that you have accepted our invitation uh, to, to give this lecture. And um, without further ado, the floor is yours. Uh, we look forward to, to listening to you. Thank you. So thank you very much for this nice introduction. I hope I can show you some exciting results today, some of them old, some of them new. And uh, to start my presentation, uh, I want to give you an overview. Uh, what you see here is 
uh, that I will first talk about something that economists are most of the time not aware of, that is that our species has a really strongly egalitarian legacy. So when you look at anthropological records, you will find that egalitarianism played a huge role throughout human history for many thousands of years. I will shortly talk about this. Then I will talk about the extent to which we can observe these traces of egalitarianism in current simple societies, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, pastoralists, agriculturalists, and so on. Uh, these are very small societies, sometimes just a few hundred people, sometimes a few thousand people. And then I will go on to the, our societies and ask the question, what is the distribution of uh, fairness ideals or social preferences, as we call it, or distributional preferences in our current societies? And I will show you some evidence on this. And then I go to applications, and by the way, being in Barcelona and knowing that Hordi was my discussant, I will shortly also, at the very end, show you the evidence we had on the nominal wage rigidity, uh, in the nominal wage rigidity paper. Uh, and the final part is also here because a lot of the evidence uh, that accrued over the last de few decades on social preferences is evidence from laboratory experiments. And then that always raises the question to what extent do we find that in the field. Now there is a good reason why we do laboratory uh, experiments because we can rule out many of the con potential confounders uh, that play a role uh, because we want to basically prove, so to speak, this research program is based on the idea that you want to show uh, with meticulous clarity that individuals deviate from self-interest and in order to do that you have to make the interactions anonymous, you have to cut them into one-shot interactions such that, such that there is no future interaction that allows individuals to acquire a reputation and so on. Having said this, uh, let me start. So, uh, for roughly 90% of human history, until about 11 to 12,000 years ago, modern humans lived in so-called hunter-gatherer societies. And there is very rich anthropological evidence uh, that indicates that a considerable share of the calories, and that was the most important currency at the time, a considerable share of the calories, in particular meat, meat was the most valuable protein-rich cal calorie source, a considerable share of uh, the calories, uh, percentage of the calories was shared, was in an egalitarian way, you know. Uh, they, what did they do? Well, they collected fruits and uh, berries, uh, and uh, they uh, engaged in cooperative hunting of big game, and then this big game was shared, typically. But these societies, they were not only very egalitarian in terms of food sharing, they were also very egalitarian in the political sense. Uh, in particular, these societies, they lacked powerful chiefs. They had a rich menu of what's called in anthropology leveling mechanisms, you know, equalizing mechanisms, against strongmen and would-be alpha males. And the means that the people used to generate equality were sometimes subtle. You ridicule people. You ridicule the would-be alpha men, but sometimes you also kill them. Uh, you ostracize them, you expel them from groups, you, sub you subject them to collective criticism, and so on. And you still find in moder modern anthropological accounts of current hunter-gatherer societies many of these mechanisms. Now, the question I want to ask here is, do we still observe these egalitarian traces in current hunter-gatherer societies? And in order to study this, in the 1990s, anthropologists and economists teamed up. I still remember a meeting in Los Angeles where we sat together and there were anthropologists teaching us anthropology and we teaching the anthropologists subgame perfection, you know? <laughs> so uh, it was qu quite something. And then they, these anthropologists went into the field and did their experiments. And one of the first experiments they did 
was the so-called ultimatum game. Many of you know the ultimatum game. It's a very simple bargaining game where uh, two players are matched, uh, one shot, and typically also anonymously. And there is a pie to be distributed, and one player is the proposer, and he, he or she can propose a division of the pie. And the second player can accept or reject, and that's it. In case of rejection, nobody gets anything. In case of acceptance, it's implemented. Now, the subgame perfect equilibrium in this setting is I give, you the, I give you one gram of my meat, if it's meat sharing, and I take the kilogram. Uh, and when it's money, I, I take $99, and I give you $1 of a $100 pie. And you say yes, because $1 is better than nothing. Now, this experiment was conducted in 15 different small-scale societies, and there was not a single society in which this prediction held. You know, typically what we observed is uh, a considerable um, positive shares were offered, and rejection of low offers were observed, okay? So, now, uh, the, the question then is, uh, can we go even further? Can we show even more uh, evidence in favor of these egalitarian roots. And for this purpose, uh, we have developed what's called a third-party punishment game together with my colleague Urs Fischbacher, and that game goes as follows. There are three players here in the third-party punishment game, and there's a proposer, a receiver, and an impartial third party. And the proposer and the receiver, they have a certain amount to be shared, okay? And the proposer can give 10% of this uh, endowment, 20% or 100%. The impartial third party is endowed with half of the share, uh, the half of this endowment, okay? And the impartial third party can then spend money to punish the proposer. And punishing means, for example, here it meant for each possible transfer level of player one, the third party could sacrifice 20% of his or her endowment to reduce player one's income by 30%. Now, this is one shot. Why should anybody punish here, you know, unless you care about what the proposer did to the responder? Okay? And so, this game has been played also by anthropologists uh, in many different small-scale societies, and I show you the data now because they are really... I, I'm still fascinated by the data. It's a 206 paper published in Science by Joe Hendrich and his co-authors. And uh, what you see here is the first, so, so I show you here first uh, what you see in the first society. So this is the distribution of offers by the proposer. By the way, what would we expect when people are totally selfish here? Well, if people are completely selfish, the proposer gives nothing to the responder, to the passive receiver, and the third party keeps the money for herself. Okay? So we should not see positive offers, we should not see punishment. But that's not what we observed. What, so this is the distribution of offers. So there are many offers at zero, but also many at 50%. But this is not my main interest today. My main interest is this graph here. This graph shows you the percentage of non-punishment decisions. Non-punishment decisions. And if people give more than 50%, if the proposer gives more than 50%, then there's never punishment, you know. But punishment kicks in when the proposer gives less than 50%. Okay, so there seems to be something special about equality here. Okay, now the question is, well, is this perhaps just special for the Hadza? This is a hunter-gatherer tribe in Eastern Africa. But if you look at 12 other small-scale societies, you see the following. Same here, similar here, similar here, similar here. Everywhere, it's the same. It kicks in, punishment kicks in, in all, everywhere. Punishment kicks in when you give less than half. So there seems to be a cross, there seems to be something like a universal uh, norm here at play where punishment seems, kicks in when people give less than half of the pie. Now, what you also see here is that this is not the same across all societies. So we see here 
Several things in all societies, the egalitarian distribution norm appears to play a key role, but there is heterogeneity in the strength of that norm across societies, and there is also heterogeneity within societies. Okay, clearly there is, but on average, on average the aggregate pattern is in one way pretty striking. Punishment kicks always in when there is given less than 50%. So I think this is a very strong indication of an egalitarian distribution norm here across these societies. And, I mean, we played this game with Zurich students, and in Zurich we observed basically the same. This is dictate, this is the proposer's transfer to the recipient. There is basically the percentage of third parties who punish is zero when you give 50% and rises to 60% and stays pretty stable there. And actually the third, the the percentage of receivers who believe that third parties punish the proposer is, is the other graph, it's also strong. So, but the problem here is, of course, these are students, and a lot of the experiments in the 1980s, 1990s, and so on, even in the early 2000s, they have been conducted with students. And it's only very recently that we went to representative samples of the whole population, so that we can say what happens uh, among non-students, and I was teaching for, for a long time uh, that there are not many differences between students and the general population, and in fact in many situations that's true. But to my surprise, in the domain of social preferences, it turns out to be not true. And I will show you later in a very specific way how, in which sense it's not true. Okay, so then the question arises, how do distributional preferences in broad samples of Western populations look like? And what are their fundamental properties? And in order to study this question, we apply an economic framework. So we, we look at basically a diagram with own payoff on the horizontal axis, others payoff on the vertical axis, and we want to tease out the indifference curves basically in this space. Okay? We want to find what are the indifference curves and when you look at the potential indifference curves, you might end up with a selfish type of indifference curve or with an envious type of indifference curve. In this case, a player, even below the 45 degree line, when the player is better off, the player is willing to sacrifice money to reduce the other guy's money. You know, pretty spiteful behavior. But uh, we have altruists and we have perhaps inequality versus individuals, that's something we want to discover. So what is the share, what, of, what is the proportion of people with different uh, preferences? Because as Cordy pointed out, we tend to assume this here. Now, what I want to say at the outset, nobody in the field, when we talk about social preferences, assumes that self-interest plays no role. It's always just what trade-offs do people make between self-interest and other uh, go goals. And when they have indifference curves like this one or the altruistic one, then they make these trade-offs, whereas a selfish guy is never willing to make any trade-off. Here he always goes for uh, maximizing their own consumption opportunities. Okay, so measuring distributional preferences. How do we do this? Well, we uh, we confront people with many negatively sloped budget lines in the own payoff, other payoff space, like this. And that means we can measure to what extent they, they don't maximize their own earnings here, but are willing to sacrifice money to go up and give more to the other guy. But we, importantly, we also have positively sloped budget lines. Now, there, is a whole, there, there are many research groups that never considered doing this in some sense, because they thought this is totally stupid. People, I mean, if people face a positively slow budget lines, what should, shall they do? I mean, of course they will move up to where both of players' earnings are maximized. Well, let's see. Uh, in order to measure the willingness to, be, to, to sacrifice money to decrease another individual's earnings when behind, we need such budget lines, okay? Good. So. And then uh, we confront them with many different budget lines. And notice some of these budget lines have a very steep slope. Now, that is very important because 
when we want to discover whether people are really selfish, you know, purely selfish, we have to give them very steep budget lines. Why? Because when, with steep budget lines, they can spend a little bit and have a big effect on the other's payoff. You know, it's, it's cheap to be nice. And the question is, when you are really selfish, even when it's cheap, you don't do it. You know? And actually, what economic models assume is you are infinitely selfish because there's only one good, it's only self interest that matters. Now, we will see that this is the exception. I mean, the purely selfish guys will, tu will turn out to be the, the minority. You will see it in the data. I don't know a, a single data set where that is not happening when you allow for steep budget lines, you know? I mean, if you, if you are at the Barcelona airport and a stranger comes to you in a hurry and you see the, the stranger is in need of some important piece of information and he or she asks you, don't you give him half a minute to explain what to help him? It's cheap for you. Of course, most people do. So, basically, uh, it's important to have steep budget lines here to really get, to have a very fine-grained distinction uh, uh, about the behavioral preference types here. Okay? And so we can identify then with these budget lines a great different, a different set of pre preferences like altruistic preferences, efficiency preferences, envy, spite, and so on. Okay, now before I show you the results of this experiment, which by the way is conducted in broadly representative samples of the Swiss and Danish population, uh, we, uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, some, notation, some very simple notation uh, and which, which is related to this here. So we say, we, we code decisions of the subjects as follows. If they maximize their own income, we assign the number six to them. So they have six, six or seven options from zero to six, okay? We assign the number six to them, to this choice. When they minimize their own earnings, we assign the number zero. And when they go for equality, we assign the number three. It's very simple, a simple coding scheme. Now, for positively slow budget lines, uh, it's very similar. If they equalize, they go on the 45 degree line, it's three, okay? If they maximize their own income, it's six. If they minimize their own income, it's zero. But maximization of own income means here simultaneously also maximization of the other's income, okay? And now we, we represent the data in this graph here. What you see in this graph here is the median choice of subjects across all positively slow budget lines and the median choice of the subjects across all negatively slow budget lines, okay? So, for example, if somebody goes always to six, then the median choice clearly is here, the selfish one. So, six, six is the selfish type, okay? Always maximizing own income. Now, this here is a spiteful type. Why? Well, on the positively slow budget line, on the negatively slow budget lines, this type maximizes their own income, okay? That means minimizing the other guy's income. But on the positively slow budget lines, this guy goes in this direction, you know? He is willing to pay to decrease the other guy's income. Okay, this is a spiteful type. But then we may have, for example, an inequality diverse type who goes most of the time for equality, and we may have different types of altruists. For example, this would be an egalitarian altruist. Why? Well, this egalitarian altruist, he goes to equality on negatively slow budget lines. He goes to the 45 degree line, but on positively slow budget lines, that's this axis, he goes, he maximizes the own income and the, and the other guy's income. There's no trade-off between the two, you know. I can increase your income by increasing my income. So there's no trade-off. But you may also have weak altruists or strong altruists. A strong altruist is a guy who, who really minimizes own income on negatively low budget lines. So I, I only show you these things to tell you there are many possibilities that arise here. Because now when I show you the data, you will see that the space in which the data lie is quite restricted. And let me come now to the data. 
So what you see here is four different data sets, each one broadly representative of the Swiss population. What do we see in the 2017 sample? Look at this. We see inequality worse individual. Each dot is an individual. We see a, an agglomeration of individuals here. We see altruists and we see selfish. So basically, individuals divide up in three types. It's not scattered all over the place. They divide up in three types. Okay, you know, might say, well, it's an artifact. This is this one data set, but look at this one. Look at the next one. And look at the next one. It's pretty amazing. And it doesn't matter whether we take individuals' median choices or modal choices, you know? By the way, this, 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 this picture might give in some sense a misleading impression. Why? Because it gives you the impression as if people go always to equality. Now, they do make trade-offs. Note, we use here the median or the modal choice. So when the costs vary, people do vary their behavior. But the modal and or the median choice is at equality for the inequality worst type. Okay? Now, you might say, well, the Swiss, these are all Swiss data. <laughs> maybe, you know, they have direct models, peculiar in many ways, maybe. So let's look at some other uh, society. Let's look at the Danish society. And here we have also a big sample uh, from a paper that has we published recently that has the, we have this data, but we didn't use it for the purposes of the paper but I can use it for the purposes of this presentation, and this is a Danish sample. So, th it's pr quite remarkable that we find these three types. Now, you might say, well, this is eyeballing. Well, of course, we apply also some clustering mechanisms, some non-parametric clustering mechanisms, and study what are the clusters that emerge. But if you see these data, you will not be surprised that three clusters emerge. You know, there's nothing more powerful than the raw data, in some sense. Uh, and uh, so it's the same for Denmark. And typically, three big clusters emerge, an inequality worse cluster, an altruistic cluster, a selfish cluster. It replicates when we apply rigorous clustering methods, and the selfish type is in the minority. So for example, in the Swiss data set, we typically find something between 40 and 50 percent being inequality averse, between 30, 30 percent roughly altruistic, and the re remainder is then close to selfish, predominantly selfish. In the Danish sample, it's a bit different. Uh, it's more one third, one third, one third, and of course, you see also some other. This is there. There's a bunch of strong altruists, but there's a minority here. Okay, so we we find three big clusters. And uh, now, the, let me summarize this with the indifference curves. Basically, what we find is this type, the selfish type, the altruistic type, and the inequality worst type. We can do, of course, a structural estimation. We can apply a social preference model, structurally estimate the parameters, and we do this. Uh, but I think if you get things non-parametrically, it's even better. Uh, and so, uh, uh, these are the typical indifference curves of these types. And now the question arises, well, before I go to the implications uh, for political economy and labor markets, let me show you one interesting feature of these preferences. And that has to do with what I show you on this slide. If you look at the slide, you have two individuals here, the red and the blue one. And the difference between the red and the blue one is that the red individual has a flatter indifference curve below the 45 degree line. What does that mean? That it means that this individual is more generous because it's, this individual is willing to pay, have a, it has a higher willingness to pay to increase the other's payoff. That is what flatness means here. Okay, more generous. And this individual is simultaneously more selfish here because this indifference curve is steeper. It means that it's, it's only willing to pay a little bit 
to generate a large, you re, it, you, this individual requires a large increase in the payoff of the other guy. Only then this individual will be willing to sacrifice a little bit. Okay? So, and what you observe across individuals is, among the altruistic individuals, is the more generous they are in the advantageous domain, the more selfish they are in the disadvantageous domain. It sounds contradictory, but that's what we observe. Now, you might say, if you are more generous, you approach, of course, a Rawlsian type of preference. And if you are more selfish in the other domain, you also approach a more Rawlsian type of preference. So when you view it from this point of view, then it may be less surprising. But it is interesting to know that those who are more generous in this domain, they are simultaneously more selfish in this domain. Okay? And we observed the very same thing among inequality-averse individuals. The more generous they are in the advantageous domain, the more envious they are in the disadvantageous domain. Yeah. So it's also, it's, it looks like kind of, it doesn't fit together in some sense, but if you think a little bit deeper, well, if you are an egalitarian that is even willing to pay money to sacri you sacrifice money to reduce other people's income. So you vote, for example, for a tax reform that decreases output and maybe even decreases your payoff. Uh, and I think some people are. Uh, then, uh, for example, in Switzerland, we, had, uh, we have every three years, roughly, a very egalitarian tax reform proposal that comes from the left. And they typically don't get in a majority, but and sometimes they make a lot of sense. Sometimes they are kind of problematic. For example, one proposal was once the so-called 1 to 12 initiative. You know, the, 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 the difference, the ratio between the lowest and the highest income in current companies, in particular international companies, is more like 1 to 200, 1 to 300. Now, what the young socialists proposed was 1 to 12. That would have been introduction of socialism through the back door. I mean, a form of socialism many economists would probably not like, because the efficiency costs would have been obvious. You, you, just, you would have then kind of outsourced managers who manage the company or whatever. So you had some very weird proposals. You had also some reasonable proposals, typically uh, they, they, these proposals don't get a majority, but 30-40% of the people vote for them, showing that there's strong support for egalitarian policy proposals, even when it's not the ma ma majority. Okay, so, so why is this knowledge about the population's distributional preferences important? Now, one reason is that there's a normative and a positive reason. First of all, when we do normative economics, a hallmark of economists' principles is we should respect the individual's preferences. Okay, but if you respect the individual's preferences, then you better also respect their distributional preferences when you do welfare economics. Okay, for example, when you compute optimal tax schedules, can you neglect that many people care directly for equality? Typically, what we do is we we have a utilitarian calculus and maximize the sum, some sum of utilities and the individual's utility is only determined by, utility, by the individual's own consumption. But if individuals have interdependent preferences, what justifies that assumption? You have at least to ask you the question if you are a, a normative economist, what justifies that assumption if people have preferences that strongly differ from that assumption? Okay, so that is one reason. And the other reason is positive economics, because you don't understand the world in many situations. If people have these preferences, then you don't take them into account. Okay, so let me illustrate this with work we did uh, in political economy in the Swiss context. So we took advantage of the Swiss direct democracy of these uh, referenda that Every three, four years we have such a referendum. And this has the advantage that people are familiar 
with these discussions, and uh, they have seen, so to speak, uh, public discussions about this. And it's, you know, it's a, in my view, it's a difference whether you ask a, a survey participant, "Are you in favor of higher taxes for millionaires?" or are you in favor of this of this reform that has been proposed by so and so okay because this reform has been discussed broadly on tv in the newspapers and so on so you you have it's not the first time that people encounter that and i think that's an advantage and so what we did is we uh we, it also allows us to validate, basically, people's answers. For example, what we did here is we, we studied the determinants of support for strongly redistributive policy measures in Switzerland. We measure the subject support for these proposals, and then we validate our support measure with the actual cantonal vote share. So, for example, what you see here on the horizontal axis is the vote share in the actual referenda for these proposals. And on the vertical axis, you see the vote, you see the support that is expressed in our survey. And you see a nice positive correlation across regions here. You see it also across municipalities and so on. So we can validate our survey measure in that way. And then we go on to control for a host of covariates and ask the question, and we measure people's social preferences. And then we ask, do these social preferences have predictive value for people's support for redistribution, okay? And we also stick, before we do the empirical exercise, we construct a little model. Some of you may be familiar with the so-called Meltzer-Richards model, the, the, the classical median voter model, where you have a proportional tax that's redistributed lump sum to the whole population, you know? And then Meltzer Richards asks, uh, what's the individual's preference for the tax rate here, the proportional tax rate? And, and what you find, not surprisingly, is that if, you are, if individuals are selfish and poor, so they have a low income, then they, vote, then they are in support of a high tax rate. But the richer they become, the less a, the lower the support is until it completely vanishes. Now, when you ha in, have a social preference model inserted into the Meltzer-Richards model, also not surprisingly, if you are an altruist, in particular if you are an affluent altruist, you are willing to redistribute to the poor. Okay? And that means they are in favor, the, the affluent rich, so the rich people with social preferences, with altruistic preferences, are willing to redistribute. And if they are inequality worse, they are even more willing to redistribute. So you get this qualitative prediction. Okay, very little difference here among the poor. Why? Because you have a self-interest as a poor, uh, if you are, have, a, have a low income, to vote for redistribution. So the impact of social preferences doesn't become visible, basically. Now, what do we observe? Well, we observe something very similar. We observe this, the red line is the selfish guys. We identified them as the selfish guys. Well, in some literal sense, this is the first confirmation of Meltzer Richards. Because the, the theory predicts if you are selfish, you are, <laughs> you are, uh, your support declines with income, and that's what we find. If you don't have a measure of preferences, you only get the aggregate pattern, and then it matters what's the composition of the preferences in the population, you know. Uh, and then what we see is that if, you are, if, you are, if people are altruistic, and if people are uh, uh, inequality averse, it becomes very flat. So basically, yes, these social preferences seem to ha play a big role for the support for redistribution. And uh, that raises the next question. So, for example, we asked ourselves, so how well do people really know the, um, the, the, the degree of inequality that prevails in society? And whenever you ask this question, they're totally wrong. I mean, for example, in Switzerland, uh, the share of income 
that goes to the top 1% of income earners is 12%. Now, people hugely overestimate this. They hugely overestimate this. And the question, and so you might say, well, if people overestimate the, the inequality, then it's no surprise that they are in favor of more equality because they have a completely misperceived view of, of inequality. And so what we did, we did another RCT in which we informed the individuals. So we measured first their beliefs and then we gave half of the people randomly the correct information, half of the people got some other irrelevant information. So, and then we measure exposed to what extent are their beliefs corrected? And the beliefs are greatly corrected. So the statistical office in Switzerland has great, people, people trust the government. So in a sense, they, they believe at least this part of the government. So, so they, they trusted this, the information of the statistical office that we gave them. And so you might ask yourself, what does this to the support for redistribution? Now, before I show you the, before I tell you the results, there ha let me tell you something else. There has been a recent meta-analysis about the impact of information, true information about inequality on support for redistribution. And the results are all over the place. It's basically no clear result. Now, when I tell you why I believe there's no clear result, because 99% of the studies have no measure of social preferences. Because if you ask yourself, why should a selfish guy respond to information about inequality? The selfish guy has a selfish preference, and we know what he wants. He wants this, regardless of his beliefs about inequality. But if you directly care for inequality, like the inequality-averse guys, then you might respond because you directly care about inequality. And so what we did is we corrected people's belie wrong beliefs about, redistrib about, the, about the inequality. We, 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 they revised their beliefs downwards because they believed the top percent earns 40, 50, 60 percent of national income. In fact, it's 12. And what happens is the selfish don't move. The altruists also don't move significantly but the inequality of Earth move. So you have to have preference information to, to assess or examine this question, because otherwise you get results that are kind of what you get, what, you, what the literature shows you get. They are all over the place. Because if you lump people together, we also find no effect. If we lump all, all types together, we find zero influence, zero, no, nothing significant. But when we look at the type-specific behaviors, then we see that the inequality was respond to this piece of information, which is, in a sense, a further validation of the importance of having this information available. Okay, so let me go on to the Danish example. So here we ask the question, here we have also redistribution questions. And here what we do is a little bit different. We, we estimate the structural model, and so we have basically uh, a, a structural parameter from the envy part, and we have a structural parameter that captures the generosity part. Those who know social preference models, alpha and beta, it's called, it's like beta delta in hyperbolic discounting in social preference research, it's alpha beta. Uh, so alpha is the envy part, beta is the parameter for the generosity part. And the question is, do these structural parameters predict support for redistribution in the way they should. Okay, and how should they predict? How, what would we expect? Well, we would expect more envy is more, people who are ceteris paribus more envious in the uh, disadvantageous domain, they support redistribution more strongly, and people who are ceteris paribus more gener generous in the advantageous domain they also support more redistribution. And that's exactly what we find. So here you have basically people's rank in terms of generosity, and here you have people's rank in terms of demand for redistribution. Now, 
behind every single dot here are almost 2,000 observations. So this is not a regression with five observations, you know. Uh, and, and the same here. Uh, so basically, yeah, uh, these two structural parameters, they are predictive of the desire for redistribution. Okay. Now, we also have data on the nice thing about Denmark is that you know a lot about people. We have also data about administrative data, not self-reported data, about their charitable contributions. And so we know how much they gave to charities, in particular charities that help humans in comp versus charities that help animals, for example. Uh, and what we, would what we would predict here is, if you are a more envious Tetris Paribus, you're not giving more to charity, just intuitively that kind of is clear. We, you can write it down in a model, but if your envy part is bigger, you're probably less likely to, to give to charity. But if your altruism part or generosity part is bigger, then you're more likely. So that would be the prediction. And that's what we find here. So this is the, N, this is the, L, the generosity part. The more generous, the more donation to charity. The more envious, the less donation to charity. And now finally I come to to the paper Hordy uh, mentioned, but before I do that, I show you one other paper that I find so fascinating that I can't resist to tell you about its existence. Some of you may know it. And it's a paper by Breza Kaur and Sham Sadani in the QGE published 2018. And before I show you the details here is, there is a lot of lab evidence that shows that Wage inequality has detrimental effects on effort provision. Okay, when people get paid differently in similar situations or perceived seemingly similar situations, then that has a detrimental effect and it provides a rationale for pay compression. Okay, now, but they did a field experiment, a beautiful field experiment. The field experiment goes as follows. Uh, there is there are production teams with three members. They produce together and they have lunch together. They are in the same physical space typically the whole day. The, the authors assess baseline productivity of these individuals in initial training phase, and they receive all the same daily training wage during this baseline pro productivity measurement. And then they have the following treatments. So they have a so here you have basically the workers rank in terms of productivity. You have low productivity workers, medium productivity workers, and high productivity workers. And in the pay disparity condition, they get paid differently. Okay? But then they have a pay compression uh, condition in which everybody gets a low wage. And they have another pay compression condition where everybody gets a medium wage, and another one where everybody gets a high wage. And that enables them to compare these to the low productivity workers in the disparity and the compressed group where they get the same wage, but the others get a different wage. You know, here the others get the same wage as the low wage, low productivity workers get, whereas here the others get a higher wage. So how, what's the impact of this compare, what, what's the impact on effort or productivity for the low productivity workers. The same in the middle uh, uh, line. What's the impact for the medium productivity workers and what's the impact for the high productivity workers? And what they find is quite, quite interesting. So here you see day, day zero, this is the training phase, this is the initial phase, so they're, or this is be before they introduce the different treatments. Uh, and then you see, for example, here from day zero onwards, that in the pay disparity group, the low productivity workers' productivity is lower than in the pay compression group. And the, the surprisingly also, the same holds for the high-ranked workers. They get less productive in the pay disparity group compared to the pay compression group. And the effect is pretty big, 
And they have many other supporting evidence uh, that suggests that this is, has to do with fairness concerns. And they have another interesting treatment variation. They vary the opaqueness or the, the visibility of pay, or of, of the productivity difference. So they have, in one setup, it's very easy to see who is more productive. And in another setup, it's very difficult to see who is more productive. And what they show is when it's difficult to see who is more productive, so when productivity is kind of hidden, then these effects ob are obtained. Then the other workers, so let's say that those who are paid less in the pay disparity group, they feel underpaid because they don't see that the others are more productive. But when it becomes visible, the effect goes away. So it's, it's kind of very nice. Uh, a very nice experiment, very nice field experiment that shows the importance of these fairness concerns and how it's modi modulated by visibility, transparency, and so on. Now, I come to the final part. This is the paper <laughs> that Gordy was a discussant of, was published in the Journal of Monetary Economics 205. And here we took Swiss, they, I mean, they're, at that point in time, there was already literature that shows the existence of nominal wage rigidity. And now the question is, does it have real effects? And then we economists are, we are very creative in inventing stories uh, that save an old theory from rejection. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go into all these arguments. So the only way to overcome, to solve these issues is data and better data and better data. And so. What we did, what we had in Switzerland, we, first of all, we started with two big companies, and we looked at their distribution of wage changes. And you, you don't have to be a great econometrician to see that there is nominal wage rigidity here. <laughs> when you look at the distribution of wage changes here, uh, it's really <laughs> mind-bogglingly clear uh, that there's nothing below zero, basically. Now, then we went to representative data for Switzerland, and across these inflation, inflation periods, you know, in 1990, we had high inflation. Swiss National Bank, Bank put its feet on the brakes and inflation declined. And what you see here is, this is the zero, okay? We have a little spike at zero and the inflation is roughly 5%. Then the wage distribution shifted to the left more and more, the lower inflation becomes. But the zero wage changes, they pile up here, so that we have here basically more and more. Uh, so so it's, it's, you, you see literally in the graph the resistance to, to wage cuts. Okay. And that, with the help of an econometric model, we were able to measure what we call the wage sweep up. So what would wages have been in the absence of nominal wage rigidity? And by, what, by how much is the real wage higher uh, uh, because of the nominal wage rigidity? And we were also able to, to, re to, to correlate, basically, regional and uh, sectoral unemployment rates with the wage sweep up. Okay? And that's the graph you referred to at the beginning. And that's what you see here. And again, you don't need much. You know, this is, you don't need to do a regression here to see that this is a positively sloped line here. So this is across cantons. This is across industries. The higher the wage sweep up, the higher is the unemployment rate across these sectors, which kind of indicates, the, in my view, the importance, I mean, of fairness concerns, but I should add, it's not just fairness concerns that play a role here. When it comes to nominal wage rigidity, there are at least three behavioral factors that play a role. One is, in my view, loss aversion. The other is money illusion. And the third is fairness concerns. And then the three come together, you have a pretty potent behavioral force at work. Uh, and uh, fairness concerns is part of the story, it's not the whole story. And that brings me to the end, so let me summarize. There is rich anthropological evidence indicating that humans lived under extremely egalitarian conditions for most of their time, uh, really thousands of years. And when we think, for how long have we been in capitalism? 250 years, I mean, that's, 
That's not even 1% of human history, you know. Uh, and uh, there is still an egalitarian ethos that can be observed in individuals' behavior in contemporary small-scale societies. It shows up in many experiments with students also and with the general population. The distributional preferences in representative broad population samples can often be characterized by a parsimonious type distribution, inequity aversion, altruism, and selfishness. And laboratory measures of distributional preferences have good predictive power for real-world charitable donations and for real-world support for redistribution. And finally, inequality aversion appears to play a major role in the political demand for redistribution. It almost nullifies the impact of income on demand for redistribution. Remember the, 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 the steeply sloped line for selfish individuals. The more income they have, the less they support redistribution. It really moves up quite a bit and becomes pretty flat for inequality versus individuals. And it's also primarily the inequality verse that respond to information about actual inequality. And finally, fairness concerns have important effects on labor markets in terms of pay compression, resistance to wage cuts, negative employment effects of deflationary policies. And for those who are more interested in these issues, I just completed a review paper for the Journal of Economic Literature on social preferences, fundamental properties, and economic implications. You can download it from my web page, and you find lots of what I have said today in much more detail and much more depth in that paper. Thanks a lot for your attention. Hey, thanks a lot, Ernst, for a, a great uh, talk. Now we have some some time uh, for for questions, if uh, yes, you yeah, don't mind. Yes, so, yes. Uh, please, and we have a, the um, microphone. Just a second. So thank you very much. The, I, I thought that was very interesting. This is not my field, but I, um, yeah, it was really striking, this, this finding of the three groups that people are selfish or uh, altruistic or averse to inequality. Now, my question is, um, in terms of how to interpret your, these results, I don't believe that anybody is like purely selfish, like you care only about yourself. Is the way to interpret this, um, so should we interpret this as, um, so when we think of others, we can think of, you know, um, everyone cares about, you know, their children, their family, their friends, people in their, I don't know, ethnic group, religion, country, so people in my group, um, I guess everyone, you know, is uh, to some extent altruistic towards people in their group. So is the way to interpret your results uh, about um, selfishness, outside of your group or, or you know, have yeah, this, this I, thing is bothering me about yeah. uh, selfish, what do you, because, yes, you know, what, yes. what do you mean by this and yeah. should we think so about it? So I think it's a very important question and it, it's related to another line of research where Ben Anke and others from Harvard have done a lot of work. It's this universalism, do you have, do you hold universal values that apply to all people or do you hold very particularized values that apply only are you just loyal to your own group? And, well, my, my interpretation of human history is that the more we were engaging in, in, in trade and, and in interaction, the bigger the circles became for which we cared positively. I mean, let me start even more fundamentally. Nobody in this literature says, when, I, when we talk about an altruistic person, we don't mean this is Mother Teresa who gives up all self-interest. That's a completely wrong view. It, it means just they also care for other people. Now, you ask a very important question, who are these other people? And that is in itself an interesting question because there is a literature 
on parochialism, on parochialism, with narrow-minded altruism. You know, the, and uh, a narrow-minded altruism is where people tend to be very altruistic to their local group, but not very uh, altruistic to outsiders, or not at all, even cruel to outsiders sometimes. And that exists. There's no doubt about that. But that's a whole other dimension that is important. So when, what I'm talking here about, when, I, when you take Denmark and Switzerland, these are, despite its, I mean, Switzerland is actually quite a culturally diverse, has been a culture, culturally diverse society because we speak, it, there's an Italian part, there's a French-speaking part, there's a Romanic part, there's a German part, very diverse in some sense. And we even speak sometimes of big divides across culturally between the Latin part and the non-Latin part. Despite that, it's, it, it grew together over the years, you know. Over 600 years, it, the country grew together. And, and the citizens care to some extent for each other. That's the willing why they are willing to support for social policy measures. And that's also the reason why mi migration, for example, is, could, could be one of the big obstacles of, for maintaining the welfare state because people, we lose the support of people for the welfare state because they don't want to support the newcomers. I think there are clear boundaries, that's an, but that's another type of research. Very interesting. And actually, we don't understand, I mean, this is a fast, fascinating topic in my view. When do people start including others into their own group such that they also start putting a positive weight on their payoff? We don't know, we have no clue. But it's a fascinating research question where we know very little. Yeah, this is about, um, is there any evidence about changes over time? Because you start with anthropology and then uh, at the end you say we've had only 250 years of capitalism, but a lot of people think that this kind of commercial society will change preferences or affects preferences, but yeah. I don't know where they take this from or I, d I d really don't know what the evidence is for this or if there is any. Well, there is, uh, I think this is, the, 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 the question of the endogeneity of preferences is one of the big unsolved questions. In my view, it's pretty clear that they are endogenous to some extent. And the question is to what extent and how are they formed? I mean, they are endogenous even, uh, for example, there is now emerging evidence on children's social preferences. And if you measure children's degree of altruism towards other kids, it can be strongly affected by how they are treated by the adults. So there is a beautiful evidence on that. I mean, Armin Falk and co-authors have a paper where they have a randomized controlled trials where there is, a, in a, a Journal of Political Economy paper, where they uh, assign randomly a, a, a pro-social caretaker to a kid, to a poor family kid. And then they have a, a control group where that's not the case. And when they measure the prosociality of the kids one year apart, what they are able to do is they can basically break the intergenerational transmission of prosociality. What do I mean by this? Selfish mothers turn to ha tend to have selfish kids for whatever reason. And when selfish mothers and selfish kids undergo the treatment, it's the kids that undergo the treatment, then the kids become pro-social. When they are interacting with a pro-social caretaker half a day per week for 40 to 50 weeks. So you can change social preferences. I think you can now. So I think our institutions, how we interact with each other, uh, the, the, our trading institutions, our educational institutions, they have all hidden, un, unobser unobserved and unknown effects on, on, on preferences. And we just scratch the surface. We have not even, maybe we have not even scratched the surface in understanding this. And it raises a whole lot of questions that are related to welfare economics. What, what, how do we do welfare economics if preferences become endogenous? You know? I mean, for example, 
I give you one, one other example, Sule Alan from Florence. She has done beautiful experiments showing that she can make children more patient. Apparently, we are able to, to, to shape their intertemporal preferences. They are not innate. And so, uh, I think it's a fascinating open terrain for people who want to uh, do interesting work and become famous. <laughs> okay, more questions? Hi, um, very good, very interesting uh, presentation. I have a question regarding um, the, the two countries that you choose, that was chosen for this. Um, there are two, two countries that is considered really social, so they really are social minded. Yeah. I would say the most, when, when I saw the second one was Denmark, I was kind of okay, it's not, it's not. <laughs> it's another Switzerland. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Switzerland is another Denmark. <laughs> well, not quite, but uh, let's go on. I can tell you how they differ. <laughs> so, um, my uh, question here comes, um, have this um, done, has been done it in other countries that are completely different or has nothing to do, even at least in Europe? I yeah. would not say not even in, in other continents. Even Europe, if you go just south, has yeah. nothing to do about it. Yeah, so I, we, in, in the review paper I mentioned at the end, we, put to, we have a table in the review paper about work that has been done on social preference measurement in representative samples in, also in Germany and the US. So we don't have that many representative samples yet. We have Switzerland, we have Denmark, we have Germany, we have the US. Uh, and in the US, what we find is roughly 40% inequality versus people. We were pretty surprised, 40% uh, inequality versus people and uh, something like 30% uh, altruists uh, or even 30 to 35. And again, the, the, the purely selfish uh, minority. So I think it will, in, in, in all the modern societies, I, I'm become, if you, if you would have asked me Ten years ago, I would have given you a completely different answer. Uh, re remember the three types. So when I started writing the paper, the review paper, this was at, at least intention. The intention was to start in 2016, but uh, in the end, I started in 2022. But the, the, the state of the art was based on student evidence, and you know. In the, student, in the student samples, there's one type missing. And we have now a paper on that even. There's nobody who is in the inequality verse group. The students are not inequality verse, basically. There's very little inequality version among students. And it's, uh, it seems to be due to two factors. One is education and one is age. The older people become, the more other regarding they tend to become. That's what we find. And the more educated they become, the, in some sense, the less inequality worse they become. So it's the envy part that vanishes. You know, when you look at the, at the indifference curve map, it's the, it's the part above the 45 degree line where the students, they have no positively sloped indifference curves. They, they are altruists. Uh, and so the, there are dif differences across socioeconomic groups, but not across societies. So we were very, and, and actually, the, it's not just uh, between inequality, it's not just the case that inequality version vanishes among students, literally, not, I mean, maybe there are 8 to 10% of, of these individuals, but not more. But when I go to general population samples, then there's generally much less selfishness. Students are more selfish. They show more selfishness in these experiments. And, uh, and this is, uh, uh, so, and they are less altruistic also. There's, men, there's now really very strong uh, pattern ac across the, the field, so that shows this. Yeah. 
but it's not so much across society. So I would be surprised if I see something different, but you know, I don't have the data. Maybe I will be surprised. I also was surprised to see so much inequality version in Switzerland. I had given up to believe in inequality version, so although I invented the theory, so I was kind of depressed <laughs> because I thought, oh, there's nothing here there. And then I stumble in my Swiss data set suddenly with the general population on this huge amount of inequality version. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? You don't have a question? Oh, here. Okay. Uh, very interesting work. I was wondering if um, you um, you also studied whether this degree of altruism depends on whether these interactions happen in, in a physical space or over, say, the internet or in a more anonymous way, because we we live in more and more in a society where some of these interactions are a bit more anonymous, and, and so I wonder if uh, if the human physical contact makes a difference for preferences. I have not studied this, and I am also not a, like, aware of. I am sure some people must have studied this. I mean, there are there are papers about altruism on the internet. Um, uh, or pro-sociality on the internet, Wikipedia, you know, who, who contributes to Wikipedia, what are the returns, to what extent is that altruistic, to what extent is that reputation enhancing. So there, there is clearly a literature on this, but I'm not sure whether, whether there is a rigorous literature that studies whether this d mitigates, so to speak, uh, altruism. Generally, I, my belief is that the more we interact, the more we, uh, the more we start caring for others. And actually, uh, those, for those who are interested in the endogeneity of, of, of these traits and uh, kind of social preferences are just one of these. There's this great book by Joe Henrik who, who ha puts forward the hypothesis that it was... Uh, the big divide between the Eastern and the Western Catholic Church, basically, because in the East they were forbidden close current marriages. They, in the in the West, they, they, they kept, the Church was forbidding that, and the, in the East not. And forbidding these intermarriages, intercousin marriages, uh, uh, created a push towards more interaction with strangers. Uh, so and and he he claims that a, a large number of individual traits can be explained by this shift. It's a fascinating book. By this, he's a he's a great guy, Joe Hendrick. So it's about endogeneity uh, of preferences, but more it's in the endogeneity even of our perceptions of our individualism versus collectivism and so on. Okay, well, we, we should bring this to an end, but let me ask you a, a, a quick uh, question, and if I may. So, um, I mean, selfish people, by definition, should care a lot about their well-being, so presumably they should accumulate uh, more wealth than less selfish people. So, from that point of view, we should expect a positive correlation between, or a positive association between uh, wealth uh, or income and uh, selfishness. But at the same time, you would think you know, very wealthy people, I mean, their level of consumption is close to satiation, maybe. They don't care so much about consuming more, they may be more generous and so. Is there evidence on, what's the, what's the evidence on the correlation between, are richer people I more selfish? You, I can tell you a funny story about this. So, we have this paper in 2020 about uh, time discounting and wealth inequality. And what we were up there with, with my Danish co-authors, we wanted to look at the, to what extent do differences in time discounting explain wealth differences. And it's a difficult task because you have to control for so many things. But we were able to control with Danish data for a, a, a really a big number of things. And one finding we had, and I was keen to put that into the paper, but I 
I lost the fight against my co-authors was the thing <laughs> about the correlation between uh, social preferences and wealth inequality. And what we found is a, a small yet yeah, but significant negative impact of your prosociality on your wealth. So controlling for, and, and that regression controls for time preferences, for risk preferences, for parental wealth, uh, for your wealth when you were at age 18. So we had really very good controls. Uh, but you know, when you, when, when you are in a, you, you know that we don't want to overload papers sometimes with messages uh, because uh, the referees ask new questions <laughs> 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 that you may not want to answer or I don't know. I mean, you, you just don't want to have these questions on the table. <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Ernst, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, analysis and lately a lot of work on poverty and inequality. She, uh, her research has been funded for many, many uh, public institutions, but I would like to highlight, I think, the three most important ones, the year C grants that Marta uh, obtained, all the three steps, the starting one, the advanced one, and recently, in 2021, the advanced one. Uh, of course, the list of publications where we can see all Martha's contributions is long and impressive. She has been publishing her research in top journals in economics, but also in political science. And I think this is a very nice and good combination. Uh, awards and recognitions, here I will uh, be a bit more precise because Martha has received a lot of recognition for her career. Sure, because she's super young, but still she has many awards. And I would like to tell you about two of them. Uh, she was awarded one year, uh, the Banco Guerrero Award, now is called the Banco de Sabadell Award for the social scientist, the excellent best social scientist under 40 years old. And she was the first woman, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a thing that we need to acknowledge. And more recently, she also got the Rey Jaume I Award, uh, basically last year, in 2022. And she uh, is the youngest researcher receiving this award. So I think these two awards make uh, clear how Marta has been contributing and recognizing her research. And finally, I would like to uh, highlight some of her research, recent projects. Marta is now uh, on big data, right? And she has this uh, big data inequality lab that she's leading. And she works with uh, fantastic new challenging data to better measure all the economic phenomena that she wants to understand and explain. As an example, uh, Marta leads a team that is working with uh, income individual monthly data. So this is what they are working with. And of course, this is a complicated work. Treating this data is complicated. So Marta has a big team, larger than ever, with computer scientists, engineers, of course, economists, but historians. And this is the part that I would like to, to tell you about, because you know, just being this super cool new data that we have, but also, as Marta started her career, uh, caring about history. So Marta works in the Archivo Indias, collecting, extracting all the data that uh, is there, going back centuries ago to understand the origins of states and institutions, following last name of people back, back centuries ago, knowing about the education of the leaders in the past um, to understand where we come from. And I think that this nice combination of super cool yesterday data, but fantastic old data from centuries ago makes Marta's research very interesting. And finally, I would like to tell you that I think that she's the example of a social economist, caring about uh, how our society is doing today and how our societies could be better tomorrow. So nothing else it has been short, but I think uh, intense enough. Thank you very much, Marta, for accepting uh, the invitation of the Catalan Economic Society to be here to give this keynote speech today. Thank you very much. So thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. 
and also thanks very much for the generous uh, introduction. Um, so what, uh, what I'm going to talk today is um, among the different things that uh, she said is about this uh, project that uh, we, we started many years ago uh, using information in Archivo, in Archivo de Indias. So I will try to concentrate on a past project, the, the actual one, which is the one that I, in the middle, and the future that they have many different uh, projects with different uh, large team of, uh, of senior and young researchers and, and uh, students that are now becoming in, interested in this, okay? So I will start with the, the main project, but I will just go uh, back and forward to understand the, all, the, all the, the idea, all the, the, this, uh, this long-term project. So, uh, when we start the, this idea of, uh, you know, going to look for a, for a, we get interested for the history of the colonization of the, of uh, Latin America, the idea is that the situation of the, con of the conquest, and I will tell you later, corresponds a little bit with a natural experiment, okay? So it's the first time that we can get data at the very, very early step from 1492. So I will mention later that many of the, of the treatment that the, the literature on comparative economics work is on treatments that are in the middle of the colonial period, which generates many problems. Here we go at the very beginning. But this is very costly because we need information of the, the earlier settlers, the early institutions, the earlier leaders, etc. So the first part of the project that I will mention, but I, I'm not going to concentrate today, we, we try to collect information and understand who are the individuals that join the Westes, enroll the, the Westes, and move to uh, Latin America? So that are the first settlers, and in particular the ones that arrive there, not the ones that live with the ship, the ones that arrive, the ones that survive and founded the city. Some cities were founded with just 10, 15 people, okay? In the second part, and of course, we study there the human capital that moved there, and this, if this has an effect on the long-term uh, uh, long development, institutions, et cetera, long-term outcomes, okay? The second step was to study if these leaders, which are the first leaders that rule a city, uh, uh, um, a village, were important or not. And the third part, we move to the uh, the rules that they wrote. And that's very important because the rules were written in Spain without knowing anything on the characteristics of the, of the land that were there, okay? So from Archivo de Indias, we could get uh, the information on the first people that arrived there. And this, it, it was uh, not directly from Archivo de Indias. We have a large uh, amount of people that have been working for the last 100 years, not economists, but linguistics. They are very interested in knowing how the Spanish language extended in Latin America. So they collect a lot of information on each uh, individual, where they settled, where they were coming from on the occupation. So for example, the, the, the last uh, amount of uh, word or, or, or um, data we work with, with uh, is with the one of Peter Boyd Bowman, who unfortunately passed away in 2010. He spent more than 30 years just collecting information. This is the, the large big piece of work done with this data. But the, the volumes start with other authors 100 years ago, okay? So this work done by linguistics in Archivo de Indias has been very useful to know the, the, the people, that, the first settled that moved there, okay? On the second part, we investigate more the leaders, and I will explain today how we collect this type of, of data, and where also what we find in Archivo de Indias about the, these first rules that the conquerors uh, negotiate with the king to install in each, to implement in each part of Latin America, okay? So let me focus today on the second one, but I will go back and forward during the, during the talk, okay? So this part is a joint work with uh, Tim Beasley at, uh, at LSE. So uh, in, the, in the past 20 years, you have seen uh, an increase in, uh, in recognition on the long-term consequences of these historical factors in shaping uh, contemporaneous political and economic outcomes, okay? But uh, still, there's a lot of debate 
on the factors that can shape persistence. What we focus here is in the possibility, we explore the possibility that probably the legacy of this conquest has its roots in the state capacities that were built by those individuals who conquered the different areas. And uh, why, why we think this is important? Well, in economics, we normally assume that the government set up the rules and, the, and they are implemented, okay? But we know that this is not like that. Some states are capable of doing that, but other states cannot do that. So what we are asking here is that maybe who that is implementing these policies are also important. So we want to know who are these bureaucrats, who are those politicians that are uh, making decisions and implementing these policies. And if these people can also have affect or could shape the uh, state capacity. So this is uh, what we study uh, in, this, in these projects. And how we are going to do that? We are going to do that, as I will tell you, uh, using the Spanish America since colonizations until today as a laboratory, okay? Like a natural experiment. I know that uh, for many people this will have some concerns, so I will address them. But uh, I hope that uh, when I explain you the context in which the context, uh, the context happened, maybe half of the room uh, will, be, will be combined, okay? So the, why, we, we do, why we can do that? First, because there's a lot of variation in local conditions, okay? Not only in terms of contemporaneous outcome today, but also in the, in the past. So the rules were set up by the colonial power, in this case, Spain. However, the uh, institutional setup and the local division of power depends a lot on the bargaining and change, okay? And, uh, and we will see this. And also because um, at, the, at, the, at this period, at the beginning of the colonizations, and that's a, a key contribution of this long-term project, this territory was virgin in terms of European institution. Of course, there were other groups, and we're going to codify the characteristics, the institution uh, set up of the previous groups, but in terms of European convictions, these territories uh, were virgin, okay? So, okay. So what we do in these projects, so the first part, in all these projects that I show you the, the the, the three points at the beginning, there is a contribution that has to do with the data. I briefly explained you the one on the early, early settles. Here, we construct a unique data set which identifies which territory is associated with which, uh, with which conquerors, okay? And of course, we collect information of, uh, of the conquerors, of the characteristics of the conquerors. Sometimes people think that, well, I, I Google this, the conquerors in Latin America and appear a very nice map. If you do that, you see that this, is not, that this does not happen, okay? So everything is diffused, you see like three big names. So we don't have a perfect map with the division of the different conquerors, okay? This, I, and I will tell you how, how we did this, okay? Also, and as I mentioned briefly before, and this is a contribution of uh, the different projects in this long-term project, is that the literature and comparative development usually relies on local treatment generated by Europeans, but during the colonization process, in the middle, but not at the very beginning. Here we can uh, work with information on the first leaders that uh, start organizing the villages, the urban centers there, okay? And finally, as a, uh, as a, a big advantage is as uh, we work with just one colonial power, and you know that this is a, a huge advantage, okay? Not working with the different colonial powers. So let me just tell you what we find here, and then I will, I will explain you, so you already have an idea where we are going. We find that, in fact, this heterogeneity in, in development that we could see today has something to do with the identity of the first conqueror. Not only this, but it looks like the, character, the main characteristic that seems to explain this, or seems to be correlated, is the level of education of this uh, first conqueror, okay? Second, we also observe that if we map this into different measures of state capacity, measures of the past, during the colonization process, and contemporaneous measures of state capacity, we also see that there is this correlation. So probably what, uh, what, uh, what we are finding here, or what we think, our history here, is that probably 
uh, the, 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 the way in which these leaders build state capacity could explain this long-term effect of the identity of the leader or the education of the leader. But we are going to try to, to check all this, okay? And of course, today we are going to see this, but in the future what we are doing is we are codifying uh, the capitulaciones, because maybe it's not only the ethic of the leader, but maybe this is also through the, uh, the different laws that he negotiates with the king when they were in Spain before moving to the, to the Americas. But this is what we are codifying now, so I cannot present anything on, on this here. Okay? So let me just, uh, everybody knows that this literature is a long literature that starts with um, uh, Samuel Johnson and Robinson in 2001, so I'm not going to uh, through, go through this. So let me just a little bit talk on the very basic ideas on the historical background for the ones who don't know about the, the conquest of, uh, of, uh, of America. So this was a very fast conquest, okay? In, in less than 50 years, they could go from the north of Mexico, Zacatecos, Zacatecas, until uh, to Buenos Aires. And this was done really, really very fast, okay? Also, we know that there is a, this conquest was what they call urban. So the idea was to found villages and urban centers, okay? And there is also a large literature on architecture of how these uh, cities, they, how they, they were supposed to build these cities. Okay, so if you see many of the cities are very similar because there was some norms about how they need to build the, the cities and they want the people to settle there, okay? So, um, these conquerors have to found cities in a very large territory, which was very diverse in terms of the uh, culture of the, of the pre-existing uh, groups, in terms of also geography, in terms of climate, etc. So the, always the question is how they decide to stop in a place, how they, how they stop. So after reading many uh, chronicles of conquistadores, uh, many historians, Everybody coincides with the idea that the decision was basically based on the intuition of the conqueror and the existence of, uh, of indigenous groups. Okay? The only, the only, um, the only uh, information or indication they have from, uh, from the colonial power was that they need to follow the recommendations of Santo Tomás de Aquino that list indispensable characteristics that the land should have to, uh, to have a suitable settlement. And which are these characteristics? We have to be potable water, the land should be fertile, not very windy, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's why many of them end up uh, settling the place in which there were already uh, indigenous, uh, indigenous groups, okay? And how, was, how uh, everything start? So everything start with an in, uh, individual uh, want to go to uh, Latin America. The reason is just because they want to get socially promoted, they want to get uh, rich, so probably all of them were risk lovers, okay? So they uh, talk with the king and uh, they sign a capitulation or an instant, okay? So the king never puts money. So in 99% of the cases, there was no money. The money was all private, okay? So then this person that has a uh, capitulación, instancia, go to usually to Sevilla. So they put a table with a flag and then voluntary people sign to get enrolled in this Weste. The moment in which, in which they get enrolled, that's what it's called military groups, they implement the military rule. It means that you cannot leave the Weste. If you leave the Weste, you, they apply the death penalty, okay? And these people can uh, bring horses, different things, or maybe there they can fight, and the the, 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 what they will receive, the price they will receive, depends on all this, okay? If there has, if they has been a lot of what they call a um, uh, bloody fight, then this person and survive receive probably more than the one that didn't fight, okay? Um, so then this group move to Latin America, and they, some of them survive. When they arrive there, they start working be, uh, based on the direction. So we are talking at the very, very, very beginning, okay? So they work on the direction that it was, uh, it was signed in Spain. So in the capitulation, we, we not only observe 
that, uh, that I will tell you later, but they say the possibility to tax, et cetera, et cetera. And, but they also say the direction they should go. Okay, so for example, they say from the moment you arrive, you need to go 200 uh, leguas on that direction. So we can even draw the limits of the capitulation. Some capitulation were not successful. Why? Because they didn't know the territory, so they sent the west to the ocean. So some capitulaciones arrive and they cannot do anything. Okay, so that's to give you an idea how uh, how exogenous was at this at the at the very beginning okay and we want to explore this this random assignment so let me just tell you uh, uh, read this part because the first part give you an idea of uh, of the situation okay so let me just read it for you there was sometimes the conqueror was successful in hiding for a particularly rich place and was successful in obtaining the kind of grants that were particularly profitable in the land where he went but instead, he sometimes failed, signing a contract and compromising his fortune to launch himself to the conquest of some very rich island that only exists in his imagination, or to rescue the gold submerged in a mysterious lagoon. Okay, so this gives you an idea that they basically didn't know anything about the land they will, they will conquer. And later on, I will show you how uh, the, the situation was such that in 1570, they have to send an exploratory group, okay, to know where the settlement were. They had no idea. And they did a fantastic uh, geography universal de las Indias, which when you read it is very detailed and it's fascinating because they say, you know, we visited uh, like a village, I don't know how many kilometers or whatever, and uh, they didn't know each other. So they, they were, they don't know exactly a settlement that was another settlement in another part, okay? So this is how it, how it works. So when they enter, it's usually what we have, and I, this is for the, I, I will have it in the first paper then show here. So when you map these first settlements, okay, you, and then we map the penetration lines, you see how each penetration line have like three or four points, okay? So this west, they will move in a particular direction, and this will be one penetration line, and some people, was staying, you know, the conqueror, the lead, say now these 10 people stay here. The rest, we continue. And you see the villages, how it's all uh, on this penetration line. We investigate whether the type of people that settled first were different from the later one, no? Maybe they were weaker. Uh, this, we find nothing on that, okay? And, uh, but this is just to have an idea how, uh, how it works, okay? So, let me just um, tell you a little bit how we collect this data set here. So in this particular project, so we need to know information on the conquerors. But the first thing that it was difficult was first to know who was a conqueror. This is something that uh, it was not easy, okay? So we use different uh, historical sources and the conditions at the end to know who is a conqueror has to be in our of interest. In our case, the Philippines was not our area of interest, okay? It needs to have a, what we say a capitulation instancia. This means that has to be responsible of undertaking a conquest and then implement the rules and has to be successful in, in, a, in, in, in a foundation. Why? Because we are going to investigate if this person had an influence with what he did in this part. So if he, if he was sent to the ocean, uh, this is out of the, of the, of the, of the list, of course. Um, there are also a few capitulations, a few groups that when they arrive and they start walking, usually they have like a couple of people cut, cutting vegetation. And sometimes they find some roots. But sometimes the roots were not from indigenous groups, but these roots belongs to an animal. They follow the roots and then they disappear also. There are few cases, but there are uh, evidence of this one or two westers that uh, disappear, okay? Because of this, of the reason, okay? So the ones that uh, finally survive, we have 25 uh, conquerors, okay? Then we are going to talk of a secondary conquerors, which is conquerors that the, the, um, the principal conquerors send to a particular uh, uh, direction, but they need to act under the capitulation of the principal conqueror, okay? So in terms of, here we could investigate, we're working now with a secondary conqueror. Could be, if I want to investigate 
whether the education of leader affected, maybe through capitulation, maybe through the way they organize, that's why we work with, with principal conqueror. The secondary conquerors, there's only a difference of a two in one case in which the secondary conqueror is educated and the, fair, and the principal is not. And here, we need, if we want to include this, we need to think that this person, the secondary, never signed any capitulation. And maybe education matters because the way he did it, even it was acting under a capitulation, whatever. But this is just one particular case. Okay? So we will work with the 25 conquerors. The second type of information is once we know who are the principal conquerors, is to know the characteristics of these leaders. Okay? So the characteristics of the leaders before going to Las Indias. So one problem here is that everybody is upgraded when they arrive to Las Indias. So everybody is, uh, you know, have titles, have, uh, are, is, are rich, etc. So is the, the education, social status before going to, uh, to Las Indias. In, in fact, the social status is based on the parents' uh, occupation. Okay, then the year of arrival, and the birthplace, in which place they, 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 they were born in Spain. Okay, so let me just put you an example of education. It's, it was not an easy thing to do, but the, the way in which we divide this, uh, we have no, no, no doubt that the leaders that are at this category have to be there. If I, will, if I have to divide each one of the categories in other categories, we will have some problems, okay? So the first category is illiterate and basic literacy, okay? Is could not read and write or had no educational degree. The second one is literacy with technical or numerical skills. Here, for example, we have uh, bankers and escribanos are here. And then the highly educated is the ones that studied at the university. Okay? At the moment, uh, uh, we have, I think, either four or five universities in, in Spain. So we checked that this was true, that they could really, you know, in which one they were, where it was funded, it was true that they really went there. So this is uh, the list of our principal conquerors, okay? So we've seen education, we have six missings. So it means that there has been no way to know. But notice that only represent uh, just close to 10% of the, of the territory. So we have information, which is the important part, of 90% of the territory, okay? So for the six ones that we don't have information, it's minor conquerors, okay? So we will work with this, uh, with this, uh, with this data, okay? So this is, um, this is just some descriptive statistics. We don't see anything uh, weird here, so fine. And now the, on another important part, which is probably, uh, if you want to see the table later, because everybody knows it's a thing trying to read the names, I will put you, I will put you later. Um, <laughs> The, the, the last uh, type of data we need to codify and was how to associate the territory to each of the conquerors. As I told you before, the conquest was a very, what they call the urban conquest, it's called, because it was based on funding uh, cities and settling people there, okay? So uh, usually when you talk with the experts in Archivo de Indias, Archivo de Indias, there are people that are, they dedicate their life to understand the, the conquest of Latin America. So just talking with them hours, they, you learn more than, than reading many, many books because they really know all the, all the details, where is the data, et cetera, okay? So they, they explain you how the conquest was done in two cycles. So one, there is a foundation. Maybe they spend six months uh, living with indigenous groups. Maybe they start building then the first houses with just wood and in a, and when they decide that they will establish there, then they construct based on the, on the, on the, on the norms they had, they have to, you know, the, 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 the architecture, the, the instructions they have of how the, to build the village, okay? And then they grow into sidecars, okay? So the conquest was from each settlement, they start moving around into sidecars, okay? And at some point they connect to each other. So in the previous work, we try to understand which were the first routes between the different, uh, the different villages to see, to understand the, the, um, if they were trade or not. And we have some information on the, on the trading. Okay, so for example, and I'm doing a parenthesis, in the first project, what we uh, realized is that the places in which there were 
a large percentage of first settlers with skills. Skills at this point means artisans, merchants, etc. that the occupation in Spain. They, uh, they diversify more in what they produce, and we know what they produce from the Geografía Universal de las Indias, which described you the place in 5073. And they are closer, they have more trading routes, small in, internal routes in the, in the, between the, the places. That is, are also described in this Geografía Universal de las uh, these Indias. So this Geografía Universal, they don't give you data. They describe things. We need to put into data, you know? If they say that they interchange products with a particular village, we need to codify then that there is a, you know, trade between this village and the other village, okay? So it's very, not precarious data, but it's something that uh, we need to extract from this, uh, from this long, long text, okay? Okay, so we, codify the, we, we try to codify data from two different ways, okay? The first one is we, uh, we read the biographies of the conquerors and sometimes they list the foundations, okay? So we could, this is one way of knowing the cities they founded. And the second one is we, uh, we check the list of the foundations at this period that uh, we know. So this period, in the, in the first, first early period, there are 123, the first early place is 123. But here we can arrive to 138 because we go on to 50, 80, okay? But these are the, the, the most important uh, cities, the earliest places, okay? So then we look at the um, history and the letters of foundation of these, uh, of these uh, cities, and then we corroborate that the conqueror was the one that the conqueror also. So we usually find no problems, okay? But this is to have the information from two sources to be sure that the city was under the influence of a particular, a particular conqueror. So um, now we have the, the cities, so I'm just uh, uh, trying to explain how we construct the basic data. Still, we are not going to do an analysis here, okay? Um, so we need to understand how, I mean, you have the basic cities, but how we define the borders of the influence of the, of the territory, okay? So what we do is something very simple, which is we divide all the area by small cells of one kilometer by one kilometer, okay? And then we, add, uh, we assigned uh, which is the closest early village, okay? Because we don't know when there are many small villages in the rest of the territory, but it can be found later. But the territory, we suspect that will be under the influence of the conqueror who has the closest village, okay? So that's what we do to define the, uh, the territory. So this will give you a map like that, okay? Of course, this is using all the extension. But as I told you, we know that the cities where the conquest was done once you have the, the, the settlement, it was growing into circles, okay? So what we do is just to reduce that territory, just working with circles around this first settlement. This is a circle of 250 kilometers around. We could work also with 100 or a little bit more, so the results will be basically the same, but I think that 250 looks reasonable, okay? We will, so then, we, we, will, we will then validate, I mean, if there is uh, the relationship with the education and the characteristics of the, of the territory. But, the, but this is the, the territory, the area that we are going to work, okay? So let me just tell you now how we do the analysis. Well, what we do here is something very simple, okay? Which is now that we know the territory and we create this data set of the conqueror, we need to try to understand how, to, how we analyze this. Now I'm going to talk about the observation. Our observation will be a square of 20 per 20 kilometers, okay? This will be the observation we are going to, to work with. Of course, this can also change. You can do 10 per 10, you can do 15, uh, 25, whatever, okay? I will show you results with a 20 per 20 kilometers, okay? And our outcome variable, so we can, uh, we can play a lot with the data, is the uh, luminosity per night, which we know is a good proxy for regional development and uh, it can arrive to areas for which we don't have formal information on, uh, on, uh, on GDP, et cetera. Okay, so let me talk on identification. So how we are going to identify all that? Um, as I told you before, the way in which the conquest uh, was done has a strong random component because 
uh, the way in which the territories were assigned to the conqueror, okay? So as I told you, the conqueror, the conditions and the territory he was supposed to conquer was the site in Spain without knowing any of the characteristic. So it's very, it's hard to believe that he puts conditions based on the territory that they would have. And I show you evidence that some has been successful and others were completely unsuccessful. And others was like they, they gave that ocean. So the idea is that they have absolutely, they know nothing about that, okay? And, and also uh, the, the information was so little, they have to send an expedition to understand where the people settled, okay? If this is true, then this means that uh, the observable uh, characteristics of the land will be orthogonal to the characteristics of the leader, okay? So this is what I will show you here. This is done with the, uh, 200, the territory based on the, on the 250 kilometers around each, uh, each urban center, okay? So you will see that, um, so the variable is whether the territory is under the influence of a high educated leader, okay? And uh, the rest is the, all the other characteristics. There are the uh, climate, um, geographic, and also the, um, the pre-colonial, the characteristics, um, the political characteristics of the pre-colonial group. So maybe one could think that leaders with more education probably decide to stay in a place in which the indigenous groups were more developed. No? Or could they stay in a place in which the, ter the territory was more, more uh, fertile. This is not the case. If we also uh, do this just working on the penetration line, saying that, okay, I, I am, I, they gave me this part of the territory, but I will stay there in the best places, we don't find this, okay? So this will give support to our, uh, the idea that the context in which the Latin American conquest happened was quite, um, was quite random. But still, since I know that even I say this hundreds of times, many people, many young people won't believe that, <laughs> we are going to do a traditional adjacent study, okay, to infer causality, uh, using borders of conquerors of different level of education in the same country today, okay? A very traditional adjacent, uh, adjacent study. Okay, so I will present both results. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, okay, is uh, we need to know if really conquerors matter or not. Okay, so we are inspired by the work of uh, Bertrand, 2003, that works with Theos. And uh, the first thing we need to do is whether they matter or not, because if the fixed effects of conqueror do, uh, do not matter, then there is nothing we can, uh, there's no, uh, it's not worth to continue, okay? So what we do is something very simple, okay? We, the, our outcome variable is the regional development today. Then we put all the characteristics uh, you can imagine, and you know, every presentation, uh, people give more, more uh, variables and variables. I think now we have all of them. Uh, controls of climate, geography, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, here we put just the fixed effects of the conquerors. So let's see if the conquerors matter or not, okay? Of course, uh, standard errors cluster, uh, at conqueror level, uh, mm, fixed effects, whatever, okay? And what we see, the only thing you need to see is the last line, the p-value, which indicates that really the, uh, the, the conquerors are generally significant, okay? So now we need to understand uh, why and which are the characteristics that matters of the conquerors. So the first thing to do to, uh, uh, to try to understand what can, uh, what, uh, what can matter is to do the following, uh, it's also inspired by Bertrand, Marianne Bertrand, but doing, working with Theos, is we take the fixed effects and then we see which characteristics of the leaders explain these fixed effects, okay? Of course, this is a regression with just 18 leaders. Remember that we don't have uh, uh, education for, uh, for, for some of them, although it doesn't matter for the territory because we work with 90% of the territory, okay? And what we see is the following, okay? Um, we, uh, what we see is that we include first the high, the high education, then I will tell you different ways of including education, okay? Uh, the cutting point is high versus the rest, so the moment the cutting point and the, the variable that really seems to matter is uh, have, uh, having a state in the university, okay, versus the rest. So it looks like 
high education is the variable that seems to explain the fixed ethics, okay? And I'm including the year of the first foundation, all of them, but you will see that place of origin and uh, age and the social status does not, is, are not important. We are going to include all of them in the regressions, okay? And, and also in the, in the adjacent study, I'm also working with the social status. But this indicates education seems to be the most important variable, okay? Uh, now we go back, now we know that the leaders matter, we suspect that is education. We are going to go again to the basic analysis, which is, you know, our observation of 20 per 20, the regional development, we put all the variables, and now instead of conquering fixed effect, we just put the education and other, other, uh, other variables of the, of, the, of the conqueror, okay? Of course, I'm not going to go to all the technicalities, but uh, they, are, uh, they are there. Also here, if someone wants to, to, to interpret, then I can give you the, the magnitude of results, okay? And here are the results. So we concentrate on just on the first column. We include absolutely everything, and seems to place us, what we observe is that places that whose first leader that organized the city, organized the urban center, uh, were more, was more educated, are more developed today, okay? So the first thing we would, what uh, we do is that we drop the uh, most well-known and uh, that have a large part of the territory, which is the uneducated Pizarro and the educated Cortés, okay? So that's what we do just to see if these big leaders were uh, driving everything, okay? does not seem to be the case. The, the second thing we do is that um, I've, been, I've been telling, uh, putting here all the time the, um, well, here I put the tenor, yes. It, the, the, we, we want to see if this is because more educated leaders can stay more time in, the, in governing this area, and it's the, the fact that they are more years, the tenor that is driving re this, rather than the, fa the fact that they were high educated. So we include tenure. We also include another variable, which is period of influence, that I can tell later what is it, but it's a proxy for tenure, okay? Does not seem to affect. And finally, I'm putting just Mexico, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Mexico, because this is the areas that we, will, we are able to do the contiguous, the adjacent study, okay? So that's why I, I, I put the variables uh, either the, the three countries, uh, the three countries there, okay? Uh, I'll, this is just to show you that the results are robust to different things we do, uh, we do here. The first one, and probably the more important, is to, to see whether these more educated leaders, what they did is to establish in places that uh, pre-colonial groups were more developed, okay? And uh, how we take this data, where we take data different sources. First is the typical population density that, uh, that is using works as, for example, uh, Felipe Valencia. And then we, we update the data of hierarchy from Murdoch. You know that the ones we you work with this data know that it's very well developed for Africa, but for Latin America it's basically empty. So we construct it using anthropological information. And then also some archaeological data that uh, Luigi Pascali uh, uh, gave us to compute another measure of, uh, of development, of, of institutional development, which is the different types of te temples that were there, okay? So these are very interesting, but do not uh, reduce the effect of our variable, okay? So there are different uh, controls, and itself they're important to analyze, but it's not the, point, the, the objective here, okay? So that's, that's what it shows. Of course, second robot is that instead of 250, if we use all this map, the, the long map, where we use all the territory, we find exactly the same, okay? So that's a robust analysis. Okay, now let me, let me show the, for the ones that don't believe the results because uh, don't think it's a natural experiment, which uh, I suspect it's quite a lot. Um, to reinforce and to infer causality, we do a, a continuous, uh, an adjacent study, okay? So, that we, we separate the level three versus level one and two. I don't know if in the previous table, um, I forgot to mention, and I think it was in a column, that if instead of doing, if we, if we if instead of defining high educated, having um, going to university, we divide it between the analphabet and the rest, 
the results do not work. So it's really, what really matters seems to be having attend the university. We don't have many leaders of that. I, didn't, I, I forget to show you in the list that we have two leaders on that, Erna, uh, uh, Cortez and Guzman, okay? But uh, they have 14% uh, 14 of the territory, okay? But in any case, that's why here we work with uh, Mexico, Honduras, and Nicaragua, because this is the only places that you have a border with an uneducated and a not educated following this definition, okay? So we have, in Mexico, we have um, Guzman, high educated, and Ibarra, low educated, and in Honduras and Nicaragua, we have Hernán Cortés, educated, and Pedrarias Dávila, low educated. These are the borders that we are going to analyze here, okay? So this is the map of these areas, okay, of the different, of the educated and educated contours. Okay, why don't we do a regression discontinuity here? Because the border, I mean, I'm, I'm happy how we construct the border, okay, but it's not an exact border. This is like the borders of the ethnic groups. Nobody knows the exact lines, so it's better to do an adjacent study, okay? So in any case, we have done that, the adjacent with all the territory, but also we are just uh, reducing the 25, the 30, and 100 kilometers from the border, okay? And the first thing we need to do is to, to see if the borders were similar, to do a validation. So as, I, as we did before with all the territory, we need to do it here, okay? So as, you will, as, we, as I will show you, it's not perfectly balanced, but the results goes against us. Okay, so what we find is that at this border, the more educated have more malaria, have less fertile territory, okay, also less ruggedness, but this will go against the results. So we, are not, we don't have to be worried. It's not very robust this, but still if someone wants to say something, you will find that uh, by casualty in these borders, there are more malaria in the educated areas, okay? Uh, but since what we want to push is that there are more development, this will go, uh, this is, is not a problem for us at all. It's not a concern, okay? So let me just show you the, the, uh, the results, okay? If you just look at the panel uh, A on the top, okay? And we observe, we do the different distances, and, uh, and then uh, we change the definition of the education, okay? And you will see this corroborate our previous results, okay? It looks like, the uh, cells that are on the side of the educated in this border are performing better than the ones that are on the side of the non-educated uh, leader, okay? Um, in, the, in the panel B, in the last column, we just, what we did is just, if we change the cutting point of the education, we don't find it. So it corroborates that the cutting point is being, uh, having been to in, the, in the university, okay? In panel B, we did the same with the social status, why? Because it could be, someone could say, well, uh, maybe it's not education itself, but maybe the high educated come from an aristocrat uh, aristocratic family, whatever, and this is a social status that matters, okay? So let's uh, do the same, but changing the uh, characteristics. So doing the border of low and high status in the area we are working, okay? And does not seem to work. So it's not the social, st the social status. And finally, we do it with Mexico because this is a very uh, this is where the contiguous analysis has a large part of the of the of the observations. So we just concentrate in uh, in Mexico. Doing Mexico, we could do an extra thing. Uh, let me show you this map. In Mexico, oh, you can see it very well. Hernán Cortés has the border with Guzmán, which are too educated. So another way that one could think this is not by leader itself by borders of area education versus no education, okay? In that case, I can take the cells of Cortés, okay? If this is the case, the results are the same. It's just a, a, a minor point, but I'm sure that someone, um, you know, may come, uh, uh, come up to their mind. Why I don't, uh, I don't take also Cortés, okay? So this seems to, this seems to indicate all the results that there is something here, no? That areas that has a first leader more educated uh, tend to perform better today. But the most important question is why this happened, no? Why, why we have this, uh, uh, this effect? So there are different mechanisms we, 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 we study, and I already told you which is the one that works. 
is the state capacity, education, and culture, okay? And what we observe is that really the mechanism seems to be that they build more uh, state capacity at the different periods, okay? Just after the colonization, during the colonial period, and also we observe more state capacity uh, today, okay? And we don't observe anything on education, so the first idea was that probably more educated, they you know, they, uh, they uh, want to educate more the, in fact, they build more schools, but does not have an effect on education. Okay, you will see as different infrastructure they, they build. Okay, so uh, let me tell you the variables we, 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 we codify to see the, the state capacity. The contemporaneous variables uh, we observe comes from Google Maps. So we locate uh, um, governmental uh, building of the government and also police officers, okay, as a measure of uh, how the state is close to the to the population, okay. And also for Mexico, we've been lucky because they have a lot of information, okay, and we are able to have uh, information on municipal revenues. So for the Mexico case, we can also use the municipal uh, municipal revenues, okay. And what we find is that, in general, we see that, you know, in areas, in cells, that uh, the, the first leader was high educated, basically Guzman, uh, Cortez, uh, then they ha we observe more governmental officers, more police officers. And in Mexico, not only this, but they, uh, they seem to have more municipal revenues, okay? But the case in Mexico is just to try to use this, this observation. For the uh, colonial period, we use a very well-known data, okay, on the Caja Reales. Okay? And it's a data that has been used in different, in different papers. We have information on different, on different uh, centuries and basically capture the revenues during this period, okay? And for the, the very, very early period, we use the two books. The first is the, the, the geography, the, the Geografía Universal de las Indias, that was written in 1573. And then there was an update version from another author in 1620. And the books, they describe uh, each of the villages. The first one was to know exactly where the places were settled and the characteristics of vegetation, uh, climate, etc. But uh, they also, uh, they, they, they tell, they describe if they were hospitals or uh, schools. Okay, so we codify all this book and we locate uh, the schools and the hospitals they mention here. In the same way that they, lo they also um, gave information on the proximity to the a trade route, okay? The, all the information is from this book. And in the 1620, they were also as information. So we use both uh, information, okay? And this was the Caja Reales. Let me just give you the, okay? So uh, the first three columns has to do with the colonial period, okay? So we see that these areas tend to have more uh, royal revenues. Notice that we work with this because we, with very few cells because the first analysis we did with the royal revenues is just we uh, work with a cell in which there was a caja real, okay? Of course, we can extend this, including other uh, cells that are close to that, but the result is the same because the, the cells that are close to that have the same uh, influence, the same leader, okay? Then the interesting thing is the, these early infrastructures, hospitals, uh, colleges, et cetera, of the different books. Okay, that you see this, uh, at least the results, goes in the direction that these leaders tend to uh, build more infrastructure at the very beginning of the period, okay? So, we do something with education, with different data set, data set for Latino barometer, data set from the Genayoli et al, which is different sources, and we find anything on education, okay? We have also tried many other data sets, but in any of them, uh, we, see, we see anything. And the same with trust, okay? But with trust, the only thing with trust is trust with police that maybe has to do also with the fact that there is more, uh, more, uh, more presence of police officers, okay? But it's not uh, something that there are no, no more trust uh, of, uh, of government, et cetera, okay? So, let me just, I'm finishing. Okay, I'm not going to repeat again what I said. 
Uh, so what we are going, and I will show you an example of what we are doing, okay? So as I told you on the third part of this long-term project, uh, we want to analyze the origin, again, of state capacity and democracy, but using what we call the first constitution, the first rules that were written in these areas. And this is a, 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 good, a, a good proxy because they were written not in the place when they arrived, but before knowing any of the characteristics, okay? That's the, that's the key thing. Then we also are working on the creation of dynasties. So it's here where we are codifying information on all the, the, the encomenderos, what they call the, um, in, in the literature, they call the benemeritors. The benemeritors are all these people that deserve a privilege, usually are descendants of the conquest, of the, con of the conquerors, and also the encomenderos. So depending on the sample, what we, what we are uh, working on, we use all uh, the different, different, different pools, okay? And what we are codifying also is all the political leaders that move the, at the local level, so there are different projects, municipal level, uh, governance, et cetera, et cetera. So the, what we are doing is at the municipal level, we codify and we observe if the surname persists or not, and which are the shocks that can affect the social mobility, okay? But this is where we are codifying. So let me just show you an example of uh, this. What is this? Uh, this is an original, well, it's a capitulation, okay? Which is an original covenant awarding rights and of settlement and administration to the Spanish uh, conquistador. And look what they say. I'm just going to translate two of the sentences here that it's quite impossible to read. It's all that conforms to this capitulation shall be perpetually for you, for your heirs and successors. Another thing they say, likewise, likewise, we give you license and authority so that you can assess and moderate the taxes that each town must pay. So these are the characteristics that they have the different capitulaciones. And different capitulaciones have different characteristics. So what we will do is to see if this uh, rules or these conditions that were signed in Spain had an effect in the construction of the state building of the different areas in, in Latin America. And of course, this, you know, having the borders, it will be uh, quite, uh, I mean, the, the, the methodology will be quite uh, straightforward. And of course, we could also see if maybe the more educated sign better capitulaciones or not. We don't know. Maybe it's the mechanism through which they do it better. Maybe it's because the rules they negotiate with the king were better than, than the rest. And um, I leave it here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Martha, very much. It's a fascinating research. It's just like in a movie, when you see these risk lovers <laughs> traveling to the other side of the wall, and how after all these centuries, still these places are affected by this. I think it's an amazing project. I think we have a bit of time. If someone has uh, any questions to ask to Marta. Okay, so I mean, of course this is fascinating, so I agree absolutely that you know, maybe you can give another talk, <laughs> continue. Uh, I guess, so my question is about, is a bit about the general issue of yeah. historical persistence, right? So you find historical persistence. Uh, you selected this case, which is, I guess, reasonable being in Spain. Um, so my question is, are there studies that have a hypothesis about historical persistence and that go out and don't find it? And are they published or do we know about it? Because in a sense, I mean, even every time I see this, I also get depressed, right? Because it's like everything was determined in 1520, right? So uh, I guess to get an uh, overview of how, how important persistence is, we would need more studies, but we would also more negative studies or? No, I'm uh, sure there are many studies that try to analyze persistence and don't work. So I don't worry about this. But are they not published or not? <laughs> or are they? Well, probably they are not published, but you know about publishing, you know, you better to have a positive result than have nothing. So uh, this is not, uh, I'm sure. But I don't think that uh, this is to learn how we can change things, no? So uh, this is a long-term project on on uh, on the on this uh, history of the, of the colonization, but for example, we in the same term of leaders, we are working here more. Uh, we give a lot of importance of the importance of leaders, 
But uh, we are working ourselves in many studies, very contemporaneous, on the importance of also the leaders today, so you can change, no? And you, you reverse that. This is a way to understand that the institutions are done by these leaders, but institutions can change if you change the leader also, no? I mean, this is a, a way to, there is the, this debate about is the human capital institutions, well, institutions has to be done by someone, no? To be done by someone. That's what we try to show here. But still we could, I mean, we are working with, uh, with uh, different co-authors on the importance of leader today, not only education, but other characteristics, and how these people can change uh, uh, part of the, of, the, of the institutions. So I know that uh, people, some people don't like because they think that institutions are the ones that determine everything, but I don't think so. I think that leaders matter a lot. And we have we seen this uh, lately. So uh, these people can change. We can change. But we, it's good to know where they come, where where we come from. But, no. But in this case, 500 years went by and it didn't change. No. I mean, so, well, because maybe the leaders didn't change. No. Uh, I mean, they didn't want to change. But if you know that one of the problem is uh, this, maybe you can do something. I'm not uh, as pessimistic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question uh, is in line with uh, the previous one. Um, isn't, it, uh, isn't it a bit presumptuous to say that uh, the, um, the level of development today is uh, linked to one person, one conqueror uh, 500 uh, years ago? And um, to, uh, of course, <laughs> not because you're studying uh, the topic, but that's a bit my point of view. But my question more specifically is, don't you have here a reverse causality issue? Um, in the sense that um, you think uh, m the more educated a conqueror was, the more uh, development today. But maybe it's the contrary. Uh, the more development today is linked to the potential, the intrinsic potential of that region 500 years ago, and a more educated conqueror was either able to uh, perceive that intrinsic potential or smart enough to not destroy everything that was existing there from the ancient communities and build on those existing uh, communities. Let me, let me respond for the second one. We have been trying to do many analyses here to avoid or to, to show that it's a non reverse causality, including the adjacent study. Okay, uh, so I don't think that the, re the, the reverse causality is a problem given that uh, all, we, all we show here, no? And especially the, the, the continuous analysis, which is to have a good identification. Okay, we analyze the border of, a, of a territories which are exactly very similar. Okay, and that's why we do the validation. So this does not seem to be, uh, to be, to be the case, okay? And in any case, one of the most educated uh, destroy a huge empire. So uh, I don't think that it's, uh, it's the one example that uh, maintain the, the, the empire. We don't find examples of good UK maintaining the, the empire, okay? But in any case, we, 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 we control for that, okay? And the fact that the, we are not saying that everything depends on this uh, first leader. This is to show, so the historical experiments here is to use a context in which allow us to answer an important and contemporaneous question, which is whether leader matters or not. Okay, and uh, the example here is that, well, this first leader start building uh, uh, or, or constructing or implementing some norms that seem to uh, matter a lot. For example, uh, some of them implement the, the ability that they could tax themselves, no? And they need to build a huge infrastructure for that. This is, is, is hard to destroy. And the ones that have not done it, do it later, it's more costly. So it's not, uh, but this is not determines everything. So this is telling you that, oh, these areas are not, uh, it lacks of infrastructure, that they don't have the state close to them, you can solve that, okay? But if you don't look at that, the inertia maybe brings you to the situation you have now. So I don't think that if you think on the uh, 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 
a way in which organize, and it's the first one that organized it, well, it, uh, we see that it has an effect. It's not the only one. But I would put the emphasis here on the importance of, of, the, of the leaders. And in that case, we do it with this, uh, with this experiment. First, Guillem, and then Asier. Guillem here. Thank you very much. Uh, mine is a very short question. Do you have access to the logbooks of the ships? To the? Logbooks of the ships? Because I'm wondering if... if uh, we have information on the people that, uh, that um, ship to Latin America. But it's not the data we want to use because some die in the, you know, we want to know the ones that arrive. No, but I'm wondering if, if you have information on how strict the leaders were, because some were really strict and some were more lenient, and to see if that can actually predict uh, development the of the economy. The norms were usually, um, were usually uh, come usually from the, from the king. No, There are some rules that some people cannot, uh, women alone cannot go, uh, gypsies could not go. So these are uh, some of the rules. But I don't think that the, the, the leader implement uh, so what we have, and I, I could uh, show it here, is for each of the leaders in the different Westes, if all of them have the same type of human capital skills of the people, and there's a lot of variability. So it's not that a type of leader has the same type of uh, setters in the Weste. For example, um, eh, eh, Pizarro um, had one of the Westes that were supposed to have people, I mean, is. Uh, as exceptional Weste, uh, the one that go to Cazamarca was more educated or more skills with the rest they have. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of variability. We inside with the same conqueror. Okay, so I'm not, I cannot think, we don't have information on rules they implement. They just want them to fight. Um, okay, now Asia. Um, so, yeah, super interesting work. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about these capitulaciones and how, if they didn't really know the area, how were they um, given an ex-ante allocation mm -hmm. and whether you signed an early or a late capitulation uh, may, can make a difference to, to what you do because I suppose l later capitulaciones have more information about the area than... The, the, the later, so the capitulaciones are the majority of them in this period, then there are few after that, but all are concentrated in this early period we have that they have no information, okay? The, what the king learned, which is this is, what the king learned is that uh, they just increase the percentage they want for them. This is what you see in the capitulaciones. The earliest one, and this is something we want to study with dynasties, the earliest one, the conquerors and the encomenderos had a lot of power. Later on, the king realized that these people have too much power. Then they start reducing the, the power. But we will see this with the dynasties. In the work we do with dynasties and how this name persists in political positions, we will investigate this, no? The, the, the amount of power that these people were, o Mercedes, what it's called, that they obtain in each of the, in each of the capitulaciones. Okay, thanks. Usually everybody, everybody started like in Santo Domingo, and then you see the one that goes to the north, goes straight forward and south. This is the different, uh, and uh, so the problem they, they, they had that they want to avoid is the conflicting Westes, okay? So if, they, if they, it took more, a lot of time, what they did, the same Weste, when they do the penetration line, you see penetration lines don't touch each other. So the maps are very, and what they did is in a particular area, they were putting in the trees like a close, just to, to show that if someone else go in that direction, they say that they are already there. They have not died. They are still going that direction. If they go far away, they will find them. So they want to avoid the conflict. So if in three years they have not yet any, any, anything, then they, that's why all the Westers show these signs in the, during the route, okay? But as I told you, when in Spain they were the site, and the idea was like 200 leguas, and some have like oceans, or, so, and they could not uh, conquer. Jordi, maybe the last question.
Thank you. So if your hypothesis is correct, the, um, the level of education of the early conquerors should affect not only the relative development today, but also the relative development 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and so on. No? Do, we, is there, is there, do we have is, uh, any kind of evidence that, that, uh, the, uh, that the, this is the case? Yeah, we, I mean, the, the problem is that we are working with different cells. So to have evidence at the level we're analyzing, we cannot have it. But, um, and if we work with, with census data, the problem is that the far away you go is very poor, you have very few places that you have this information, we try to do that. That would be ideal, no? To have, or with population density, that's the only one that one could think about, population density, which is the best data we can, we can use. But at the level of a, it wouldn't make any sense to do it at the, at the country level, doing whatever matches uh, but the, at the country level, there are countries that have two or three conquerors. So it's more at the regional level. The only proxy that we could think about is a population that I'm sure at some point we did something, but uh, why, uh, that's the only one I could, uh, I could think of.